Good morning. Let's all stand and sing Blessed Assurance. Sing us to the Lord. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine.
taken I'm accepted You have come down I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again
deep the Father's love for us. What a way to start this worship time today. Thank you, Wendy, for those uh, great songs uh, to put us into the mind and spirit of worship. Uh, just a few announcements, but I'm going to start with uh, Tom. Tom's going to have two announcements, one about the MEP uh, um, a proposal that's coming, and then also he will talk to you about the uh, Sunday school class. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this morning in your mailbox, you will find a gray voting sheet, a voting form. Um, this is in reference to <clears throat> the uh, recommendation that our current Mennonite education plan be converted to a new plan. Uh, you'll recall that on sem September 2nd, a proposal was submitted to the congregation in your mailboxes to change away from our traditional MEP, Mennonite Education Plan, where we support uh, uh, our children's uh, uh, attendance at Mennonite schools, to a new plan that we're calling the Mennonite uh, Christian or Mennonite Education Support Plan. Uh, very briefly, we don't have time to go over the details again, but uh, this converts uh, our plan from tuition dollars flowing entirely through the church uh, to the schools uh, to a new plan where um, uh, families will pay tuition directly to the schools with congregational support in terms of a line item and also a Mennonite education fund that all of us can contribute and are encouraged to contribute to over and above budget giving to support our children's attendance at Mennonite schools. Uh, again, uh, no details here. Um, if you uh, uh, need a refresher on that, I, of course, you did have a form in your mailbox, and there are additional forms uh, on the welcome table in the fellowship hall. So the voting form is in your mailbox. Um, we uh, 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 Ballots uh, t can be handed in today and up until and through next Sunday. Uh, that's September 23rd today and through September 30th next Sunday. You can fill them out and hand them to an usher, or you can place them in the church mailbox, which is on the side of the other mailboxes in the fellowship hall. The, um, if you have questions, you may direct them to any of the elders or the finance team. And uh, uh, again, uh, in summary, uh, the combined church leadership, the elders, the leadership council, and the finance team recommend to the congregation that we proceed with accepting and implementing this new plan but now we need to hear the voice of the congregation. So we encourage everyone <clears throat> to participate in the vote. The, um, 
The next uh, announcement is near and dear to my heart. It involves the start of Sunday school today. The children will be starting. The adults will be starting our new Sunday school class here in the fellowship hall about 10 minutes after close of worship. Uh, we will be uh, spending nine sessions uh, with a video series from J.D. Greer on the book of Ephesians. And that's a, a wonderful and exciting uh, series. Uh, it's my privilege to teach the first lesson today. And I believe we have a teaser video to play introducing uh, the Sunday School. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Ephesians is considered to be the most concise, theologically rich book in the Bible. This is a survival manual for Christians. This is how you can survive and, and thrive, he's going to tell them, in the midst of a world that is not friendly to your message. Verse 5, when we were dead in our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. We used to be in a graveyard, now we're in this growing, flourishing garden. Are you killing sin actively right now, or is it killing you? Are you gaining ground or losing ground? Are you in the fight? Don't you think that means you should do all you can to bring inside those who are still disconnected from eternal life? That if the people in your city, your school, your neighborhood, your family are ever going to hear the gospel, it's going to be through your mouth. This great God has put all of his resurrection power into us so that he can bring us to salvation and, and, and healing to the world through us. Before the world was ever established, before any of this had ever been made, God knew you. He knew your name and he loves you. That's what happens when you meet God in the story of Jesus. It's a, a story with such beauty and power and drama in it that just getting swept up into it forever changes you. It's not behavior modification. It's soul transformation at the, at the core level. So you see, as Paul nears the end of the book of Ephesians, he's trying to get the Ephesians to see that in all their relationships, even the most normal relationships, they're actually serving God and putting God on display. Paul's prayer here, I am, am praying for you also, that you would see the hope that God has given you in the gospel, that you would see that he's in control and that he's working in all things, that you would understand your great worth to God, that you would recognize the power God has put inside. Thank you to people all over the world who, who have yet to hear about it. Amen? Amen. It looks like an exciting uh, series. I encourage everyone to uh, hang around here and uh, take in some good teaching and discussion. One other um, announcement is the Fall Fest is in two weeks. And uh, that's a big outreach for us here. A lot of community people come. Uh, it's it's, a, it's a, one of our big outreaches here at Line Lexington. Um, there's a sign-up sheet back on the table for you to help. Uh, with that, also uh, they need um, uniced cupcakes uh, for the children. They decorate as part of the whole uh, a whole uh, festivals. They have a, a a place for kids to decorate cupcakes. So we need uniced cupcakes. And if you can, there's a sign-up sheet to bring two dozen, and that's also back on the welcome table. Okay, yesterday. Standing right up in this area, we had a great celebration. My son Zachary uh, was married to Carolyn Baker, now she's Palmer. Uh, that was here, it was a great day of celebration. There's the couple. Uh, it was uh, a fun day. We gained another, uh, that's the whole family there. We gained a daughter now and uh, uh, yes, we're truly blessed and that's Carolyn and Zach with Jane and myself. It was a, a great day. Uh, I was at the reception last night and I told Jane, can we leave a little early? She said, no, you got to stay the whole time at this one. So it was a late night, but it was a great day. So uh, uh, we're really uh, happy to have Carolyn join our family. Okay, Ed, we're going to uh, move into our prayer times. Uh, 
prayer time here. Uh, we want to remember uh, the uh, victims or the families that were displaced from the hurricane, Hurricane Fl uh, uh, Florence. It, it, I understand, I'm not sure if the rivers are receding yet, but there was still a lot of flooding at a lot of places. Uh, sometimes we're up here and you hear these tragedies at other places and we just say, well, it's glad we're not there, you know, but I think it's a time that we can surround uh, the whole south, the whole area uh, with prayer. Glenn Garris, uh, who is the son-in-law of uh, Leroy and Charlene, I think they're back there. Uh, I heard he came home yesterday. He got home. He had some foot surgery. He's doing well. We need to pray for him now as he recovers and uh, uh, that the foot will heal. He's been dealing with this foot problem for quite a while, so hopefully they have that taken care of that he can start moving on and getting back to work. Uh, Lowell told me this morning, a lot of us remember uh, Manny and Annette Modis. Uh, 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 Annette is in grave condition. She's really on her deathbed. Uh, we want to pray for her as she enters into uh, uh, God's kingdom. And we especially want to pray for Manny as he's having a hard time dealing with this. Uh, Annette has been fighting cancer for many years, so... Uh, uh, we want to pray for the Modis family as they are a, a family that this church has reached out to through the years. I believe that is it. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for the worship and the praise that we've had already this, this morning. I thank you for each one here today. And Lord, I just pray that all of us can grab something that we hear this morning that we can take with us to learn to be a better disciple, to be someone who goes out as we go out throughout the week. We meet all kinds of people. I just pray that uh, the people out there can see Jesus through each one of us, Lord. Again, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the way this church has been uh, faithful to you through the many years. I continue to pray for the upcoming changes that are taking place here at Line Lexington. Lord, we know that your will will be done. So we commit uh, uh, this whole uh, changing of pastors to you, Father. And I just pray for leadership. I pray for Lowell. I pray for Brenda as we go through this time. And Lord, um, we do thank you for the uh, blessing of, of marriage, Lord. I just thank you uh, for blessing Carolyn, Carolyn and Zach, uh, Lord, and uh, for giving Jane and myself another daughter. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you be with Carolyn and Zach as they go through their lives, lives. And Lord, I just pray that you will guide them, that you will talk to them, that you will touch them, Lord, and just be with them as they start this new journey together. And Lord, we do uh, pray for uh, Glenn as he is uh, home now. He's recovering, uh, Lord. I know Glenn has been uh, dealing with this foot problem for quite a while. I just pray that uh, this is what uh, is going to be the final thing, that he will be completely healed and he can get back to work as soon as he can. I pray for Allison as she takes care of him, and Lord, for the whole family as they uh, help him through this uh, time, Lord. And we thank you for the healing that has taken place and for the healing that will take place. And Lord, we pray for uh, uh, Annette as she is near death, and we especially pr pray for Manny, as this is a hard thing for a spouse. Someone watching someone you love uh, die, uh, Lord, is not an easy thing. So I just lift up Manny to you. Be with him when he feels weak. Wrap your arms around him when he feels like he is just losing it all, Lord. I just pray that you comfort him somehow from your supernatural uh, peace that you give, Lord. So we lift up uh, Manny, especially to you and the whole Modus family right now. And we do pray for all the hurricane uh, victims, Lord. Uh, we see all the pictures on the news and we kind of say, wow, I'm glad it's not us. Could have very easily been. But Lord, I just pray for each one of those families that are displaced. Lord, the, the people that don't know what's, what's going to happen next, Lord. Lord. Lord, you are in command. We don't know why this happened, but you are the one that is going to control everything. So I just pray for all those families that are displaced and all the people that were affected by Hurricane Florence. 
And Lord, for all the unspoken needs that are out there, uh, we continue to pray for them. And Lord, now as we uh, look to uh, give back to you, Father, uh, I just I just pray that again that you bless each one who gives, Lord. Uh, we need to give back to build your kingdom. Lord, I just pray that you bless this time together. We pray this in your name. Amen. This morning I'm going to sing a song I wrote about a congregation where I first came to know Christ. And um, they showed me what Jesus looks like. And I can say that this congregation could easily have been the one I wrote it about because <laughs> you have shown me very similar. Thank you for the smiles that you gave to me when I came home. Thank you for the hands that reached out to me when I was alone. Thank you for your tenderness when I had lost my way. It was in this house of Jesus. Where I first saw his face And thank you for your patience As I let go of my sin And thank you for remembering that mistakes are humans where we all have been and thank you for a safe place where I could make a new start it was in this house of Jesus where I first felt his heart you're his bride and you're radiant as you wait for the day you magnify his worthiness as you glorify his way and I thank you for the gift of the family that you made and thank you for the light that shines from Jesus that shows on your face and thank you for revealing what I had only dreamed of it was in this house of Jesus I found heavenly love. I found Jesus' sing one song just before the sermon.
falls He sees each tear that falls And He makes me when I call I have a father He calls me His own I'll be reading uh, several passages this morning. So if you're following along, um, you want to go to Matthew 11, verse 28, and also the book of Hebrews. You can put that, put your finger in uh, chapter 4 of uh, the book of Hebrews. Verse 28 from Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. They are the words of Jesus. And then from Hebrews 4, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands... Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. And if you go down to verse 9. There remains then a Sabbath rest for people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Blessings to you all as you bring the message this morning. Thank you, Harry. Um, About two years ago, up in Rochester, New York, uh, this gal, uh, her name is Lee, uh, there's her whole name, I'll just call her Lee, uh, 12 years old, 6th grader, had signed up to run a 5K race. A 5K is 3.1 miles. She was afraid that she was uh, going to miss it. She had her mom drop her off in Rochester at the starting line about 20 minutes early. Her mom went to park the car, and there was a group of people, runners taking off, so she joined them. Um, four miles later... She asked the runner next to her, where's the finish line? Shouldn't we have gotten there? They said, uh, you're in a half a marathon, which is 13.1 miles. She thought she was running 
3.1, found out she was running 13.1, and she stayed in the race. Finished the race, uh, number 1,800 out of 2,400, one of the youngest persons to run the race. Her mom was distraught. Parked the car, came to the starting line, couldn't find her, spent two hours looking for her, and uh, two and a half hours later found her at the finish line with a medal. Maybe that's how it feels for you this morning. Maybe you're in a race that you didn't sign up for. Maybe the race is getting tiring. Maybe you thought you should be finished and cross the line and be able to rest and there's more miles to go. The finish line is still out there. Um, this passage I've preached two other times in 30 years and both times I preached about physical rest. Um, God is teaching me that this rest in, Hebrew, in uh, Hebrews 4 and in Matthew 11 is really a spiritual rest. I put a little outline on page 4 of your bulletin, and I said something like, if you need physical rest, or if you are physically tired, you need a bed and some sleep. But if you are growing spiritually tired... You need Jesus. And come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It is about what Jesus has done, is currently doing, and will continue to do for each of us as we run the race. Um, the outline, Christ's call, our response, and his promise. The Pharisees said do. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. They made religion a burden. The picture is a rabbinic religion and one of all other religions based on works. Heavy is the load of sin, laborious and burdensome are man's religious systems with their rites, their ceremonies, their sacraments, their sacrifices, their tithes, their offerings, their rules, their regulations, their penances and their fasts, their long prayers and their tedious catechisms. Jesus swept that burden away. He said of the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 4, they tie up heavy loads and they put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift those loads. Notice the previous verse above where Harry jumped in. Um, God has hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Verse 25. Jesus calls busy people, Come unto me those who are heavy laden and burdened, he doesn't call lazy folks. He doesn't say, come unto me all you who have never taken a risk in your life. Those who are interested in lounging away the rest of your life in a hammock. We get things wrong when we believe, believe that Jesus will automatically make things easy. Um, let me hold off on that. I, we get to the uh, last point, a 
easy yoke and a light burden. A light burden is kind of an oxymoron. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Come unto me. Uh, I will give you rest. Notice the word give. There is nothing to do but come and then rest. Notice that Jesus says come and he tells us to come to him. There are all kinds of religious people out there. Some are in church celebrating mass or worshiping in a church even now but they've never come to Jesus. Some of the weariest people on earth are religious people. Religion that never teaches you about spiritual rest, as Harry read in Hebrews 4, will make you weary. Religion that never deals with your sin and your guilt never gets you to the cross never helps you find forgiveness and freedom, mercy and grace, will make you weary. If you are working for your freedom, which has been offered to you in Christ, He knows your name. Religion that drives you to perform, to be good enough, to strive to get it right, to earn enough points to somehow leap the chasm that separates unrighteous you from a righteous God in a single human-powered leap will make you weary. Religion that is so stuffy that it causes you to walk on eggshells makes you walk like some tightrope walker inching your way out on the wire balancing a 30-foot pole scared to look down will make you weary. Our response is to take. To learn. And to find. Take my yoke upon you. Jesus does not force it. He invites us to come to share in his great work. What an amazing invitation. And how few respond. What greater privilege could there be in the entire world than to be yoked to Christ, shoulder to shoulder, taking each step with him. Jesus won't shove his yoke upon you. He won't force you to sign a contract. He won't put you in a hammerlock or grab you by the collar. He asks you to voluntarily be his disciple. There are two words in this passage that stress the importance of making a decision. The word come in verse 28, the word take in verse 29. It is an act of the will. It is not just another weight to place on your already breaking back. It is the very thing that enables you to accomplish anything of value for Christ. Jesus does not force his yoke on anyone. I think I shared with you two weeks ago that God is teaching me in the area of the sovereignty of God what he has accomplished, and I shared it on the flatbed last Sunday. Him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish to the glorious Father with great joy. 
It is all about Jesus. It is his finished work, how deep the Father's love for us. I know that it is finished. To walk in that freedom to come and to take and to learn. Learning is a lifelong process. Let me just divert for a second. Um, on the phone with Manny, Manny and Annette moved to Albrightsville, to the Jim Thorpe area, about 10 years ago. And Annette would call me, oh, a couple times a year. And when, when it, the burden got so heavy, cancer is vicious. And when Manny called Friday and again yesterday, spoke of his depression and his frustration and his not knowing where to turn, the easiest thing to say, and I've said it before and I've tried to stop saying it, is that the Lord will not allow you to experience anything in life that you're unable to bear. Do you know that's wrong? It is wrong to believe that God will never let anything come into our lives that we can't bear. Look at 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, come to me and learn. The verse after Harry quit in verse 11 of Hebrews 4, verse 12 says the word of God is a, is a two-edged sword. Timothy says, study to show yourself approved unto God so that you know this word and that you can rightly divide the word of truth. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 7. Our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. Verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed about the hardships we suffered. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure. Paul says, the suffering we experienced went far beyond our ability to endure. Well, I thought there's a verse that says God will not let you experience more than you're able to bear. Paul says, in our human flesh, we could not endure. But he says in verse 9, uh, well, actually, he says right after that, we despaired even of life. But this happened so that we might not rely on ourselves but on, on God who raises from the dead. The verse that we quote is back a couple of pages in 1 Corinthians 10. If you go to 1 Corinthians 10 to verse 13, it's not talking about suffering, it's talking about temptation. Verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. There is no temptation you will face that is greater than you can bear. In the area of temptation, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted 
beyond what you can bear. That's the verse that we quote, and somehow we, we transpose that into the area of suffering. God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so you can stand up under it. But when it comes to suffering, there are those in the valley of despair come and learn. Learning is a lifelong process. The discovery is you will find rest, maybe not for your body, but for your soul. You will find rest for your soul. Jesus teaches us to trust him. We learn about the rest that he offers and we begin to experience it. It is a rest not based on circumstances because they are constantly changing. It is a rest not produced by inaction because we'll be as busy as ever. It's a rest not only for the future in heaven, but for the present here and now. It's a rest that enables us to cease our striving for our own salvation. It's a rest that brings freedom from the pressures and the worries of life. It is a rest that provides direction and purpose. It ends our being tossed around by every doctrinal wind that blows through. It is a rest that is based on the finished work of Christ on the cross. An absolute confidence that he is more than able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Did you sign up for a 5K? Are you in a marathon? You can find rest for your soul. And I don't know about you, but that's... it. Again, it's an oxymoron. I'm I'm striving to find rest for my soul. And it has nothing to do with performance, with earning something, with, with, with saying no to some temptation. It has everything to do with resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. His promise is an easy yoke. The simple fact, was it Bob Dylan? Who, who, who sang, you're going to have to serve somebody? It might be the devil, it might be the Lord. Is that who it was? You're going to wear a yoke. Get used to it. It's going to be your own yoke, your own expectations, your, your, your own toughest critic, You're either going to wear your yoke or you're going to wear somebody else's yoke, the expectations of somebody that's always telling you how how much of a failure you are or you're going to take on the yoke of Christ. Do you want to wear your own? Do you want to wear the person that keeps looking at you with the judgmental spirit? Or do you want to take Christ's yoke? He says it's easy. There's a legend that in the carpenter shop in Nazareth, Jesus made the finest yokes 
in all of Galilee. What made his yoke superior was that each one was custom made to fit. My yoke is not the same as yours. Yours is not the same as mine. We used to sing the old song, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. I found it so. The Lord will never impose a task beyond your ability if you are yoked to him. On the other side of the yoke is Jesus who carries all the weight. The responsibility is his. The results are up to him, not us. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. He promises us rest for our souls. The question Jesus wants us to ask is, what work must we do for him that will supposedly bring us rest? You know, that's the question the disciples asked Jesus. Right out of their mouths in John chapter 6, verse 28, the crowd and the disciples asked Jesus, what must we do to do the works that God requires of us? His answer is in John 6, 29. Jesus answered, the work of God is this. Simply believe on the one he has sent. It's all about Jesus. He told the crowd in John chapter 6, if you want to know what you should do to honor God your Father, believe on the one he sent. That's before he went to the cross, reminding them that a day would come when the work would be finished. What is happening here is a yoke exchange. In the cross, Jesus takes our inconceivably and unbearably heavy yoke, the yoke of sin and its consequences and its penalties, and he offers us in exchange the easy yoke and the light burden of simply trusting him. He does the work and gives us the rest. Jesus' great invitation for us to come, exchange yokes, and find rest is not intended for us to do in isolation. Wendy's song, Thank You, it was here in the church that I first saw the face of Jesus. One massive reason for the church to exist is to bear each other's burdens when we become weary in different ways, for different reasons, at different times, when we are easily discouraged and can be given in to cynical unbelief. In these moments, we need others to speak truth to us and help us believe in Jesus. That's why we are not to neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some, but keep on encouraging one another, Hebrews 10.25. So if you're weary, for whatever reason, however complex, Jesus invites you to come. Take his light, light yoke of believing in him. And if it's hard, don't come alone. Come to Jesus with a Believing friend. Believe, learn, and follow Christ's example. And you will find rest for your soul. 
Um, this morning, we have the privilege of receiving uh, Gladys Detwaller and Laurie Martin into our fellowship. Uh, I'm going to invite Gladys and Laurie to come forward, and friends, family, those of you that want to stand with them, please come with them. Uh, we're going to gather together here. We're going to have them introduced. We're going to ask them each about 110 questions. And somewhere around 3 o'clock, we will receive them into membership. It's a joy. Laurie and Gladys have been here for a while. Many of you know them. Those of you that want to stand with them. Please come forward, and we're going to do this. It's part of being a part of the body of Christ, and it's being accountable, and being a part of the family. So if you have this mic on, Merle, uh, Galen, you're going to introduce Laurie. It's a pleasure to introduce Lori, and Lori, we're so happy you're joining our church. About two years ago, during our worship time here at church, I remember that's a, in the summertime, our children would go downstairs and began to think, our, our five grandchildren were so excited about what was happening down there, you know, who is this superwoman? <laughs> that she is just, you know, regardless of the span of age, she is just providing a tremendous learning experience for them. Then we began to learn to know Lori. Lori is a teacher. She still teaches in Philadelphia Public Schools. So congratulations. We appreciate your influence. She's a tremendous, tremendous artist. Very, very accomplished. Very modest. Very accomplished. And um, she has a tremendous faith and prayer life as well. Uh, she loves Chinese food, if you ever want to take her out. Um, I thought I would just read a verse. I said to her, what is a verse you would like? And the verse she chose is very simple, and that's what we heard from Lowell today, the, the yoke. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So, Lori, we look forward to having you. I'd also like to get up and welcome Lori. <clears throat> Sue would be up here with me, but she's up in uh, northern Pennsylvania with her sisters at their old mission church. But um, Sue and I have had the privilege of getting to know Lori over the past uh, couple of years. First of all, in Sunday school when uh, I found that uh, Lori was always uh, uh, willing to stick her hand up and answer a question and make an interesting and insightful comment, which, as, of course, as a teacher, it's always greatly appreciated. But I learned through that that she is really committed uh, to Christian discipleship and learning. And beyond that, we found that we have some things in common besides appreciating Sunday school. Uh, one is some service in Africa. Uh, was it Uganda? Yes. Uh, Uganda, um, where her time there was cut short, unfortunately, by a very frightening political turmoil. Mm -hmm. But she's uh, had some uh, very interesting experiences in her life. And the other thing uh, uh, that we have in common is that she is an artist. And I would dearly love to be an artist. Um, she uh, teaches art in the Philly school system, so you know she's got some backbone if you can put up, uh, if you can hold your own in the Philly school system. But she views the world uh, not only through the eyes of her Christian faith, uh, but also as an artist. Uh, and that's a great combination. And so if she comes to your home, you know, she will interpret what she sees there uh, through her art. And uh, uh, if you have the privilege ever of uh, visiting her in her home, uh, you will find that uh, different episodes in her life are interpreted in the art on her walls. It's just incredibly fascinating. Uh, so she's been working with me and helping me to develop my artistic vision through watercolor. So uh, we're, we're getting there. We've got a long ways to go yet, Laurie. <laughs> So, uh, but uh, I've appreciated uh, that, and uh, we, Sue and I both have so much appreciated having you as a friend and welcome you to the congregation. Anybody else for Lori? All right. Walter, are you going to introduce Gladys? All right. Just a few words about Gladys. Is uh, her and her family grew up in the Plains Mennonite Church, and when she was 12 years old, she accepted the Lord as her Savior, 
at a Myron Augsburger evangelistic meeting at the Plains Mennonite Church and was baptized at Plains. And in the late 60s, she married Alan Oliver and at that time transferred her membership to Southerton Mennonite Church. And now that she is remarried again, she is transferring to Lyon Lexington Mennonite Church and feels very welcome here and she has made a lot of new friends and feels at home here. Thank you, church family, for that. Anyone else said anything? Um, I might say that Laurie spent, uh, what, 20 years with Paul Miller at New Life, and then more recently at Ambler Mennonite. Or maybe there were some stops in between. Yeah. There were? Okay. <laughs> Well, we're glad you landed here. And uh, so the letter that we've received in, uh, for Laurie comes from uh, Ambler Mennonite. Well, I will boil the 110 questions down to three. Uh, Laurie and uh, Gladys, you have previously made a confession of your faith in Jesus Christ. You have been a member of his church. We rejoice in your decision to become members of this congregation in full covenant relationship with the believers who worship and serve God here at Line Lexington. Do you now reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ and your desire to identify with this church? As you willingly unite with this church, will you worship and serve and share together with us? Will you support this church with your earnest prayers, your regular attendance, your faithful stewardship as God gives you strength? Thank you. Will you support this congregation as God gives you strength and use your spiritual gifts freely among us. Do you desire to give and receive support from others as you share with us in Christian fellowship? All right. Thank you. Why don't we um, surround these folks with prayer? Uh, I can give opportunity if any of you want to pray. Uh, if not, I'll do the praying. But if any of you would like to pray for either of these sisters, feel free. Father, thank you for Lori and Gladys. Thank you for their lives. Thank you for their pilgrimage and journey. We pray that your Holy Spirit will come down in a new and fresh way, and this will be a milestone to look back mm. upon. We do not just think of it as something for them, but also for us mm. as a congregation. Lowell talked about the yoke, and it's so important that we ourselves view uh, as being part of that yoke, of being able to join in and being able to walk alongside. I would invite you as a congregation to stand as we close in prayer for them to indicate your acceptance of Laurie and uh, of Gladys. Father, we thank you for Gladys and for the gifts and talents that she has. Thank you for her smile and her a uh, spirit of encouragement, Lord. Thank you for who she is. Thank you for her love for you. Thank you, Lord, that we can receive her into our fellowship. And Lord, uh, we look forward uh, to um, days ahead. Um, for Laurie, we thank you for bringing her here. We thank you for who she is for the talents and the spiritual gifts you have given her. 
Lord, for the joy that it's been to get to know her. And we ask your blessing on her as well as she shares her gifts among us. Uh, we ask for Gladys and for Lori that you would give them a deep sense of joy, that you would um, allow us to worship together and to experience your presence in our midst. Thank you for those, uh, these folks that have surrounded them. And we ask your blessing on them in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, sister. Thank you. Welcome. Just stay standing and we will sing our closing song in just a couple of seconds. Sure. 
And life is worth living just because he lives. And life is worth. And life is worth living just because he lives. Let's pray together. God, uh, we know that you hold the future, and we know that life is worth living because you're alive. And I pray, Lord, for any of us that are discouraged, Lord, that that reality would grip our souls, that uh, it's not about us, it's all about you, and that life is worth living. I pray that you would help us to remind others that we come in contact with of that fact, that we would be encouragers, that the life that you've placed in us would flow through us uh, to those around us, and that we would be able to point people to Jesus. Uh, do exceedingly above that which we could ask or imagine, according to your power which is at work mightily in each of us. Uh, Use us in the week to come uh, for your glory, uh, for kingdom purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll be back here in about 10 minutes to study the book of Ephesians.